Hello everyone, welcome to Dark Asia with Megan. This is Megan Lee who will be telling you notorious true crime cases and unsolved mysteries of Asia. Parts of these stories may contain opinions and speculations. These stories depict violent crimes of all types and contain graphic content, so listener discretion is advised. Let's start with today's story. Spring, a time for new beginnings. And for high school students, that means the start of a brand new year and the excitement and challenges that come with it. This was the case for Chong Soo Yoon, an 18-year-old girl from Gaesanni in Yeongdong County, North Chungcheong Province, who was a junior. Soo Yoon, who dreamed of becoming a baker, was a model student. She was also popular among her peers, especially among the boys, but she didn't let this get in the way of her studies and dreams. In addition, she worked part-time after school at an accessory store, which is where she was late in the afternoon on March 7, 2001. Soyun arrived at the store at 5 p.m., ate dinner, and started her shift. The owner, a woman surnamed Kim, went home two hours later, around 7 p.m., meaning Soyun would have been all alone until she got off at 9. 45 minutes later, the owner called Soyun at the store, asking her for a favor to drop off medicine that she had left there on her way home. The owner phoned Soyun again, this time at 8.35 p.m., but there was no answer and she was unreachable. Where had she gone? 15 minutes prior, she was seen at the store by a passerby, a woman who ran a restaurant nearby. The store owner couldn't get a hold of Soyun even after 9, when she should have been on her way to drop off the medicine. Soyun's family was starting to get worried, while the owner realized that her employee had gone missing. From then on, Soyun's parents spent all night looking for their daughter. The following morning at 7 a.m., a construction worker in his 50s surnamed Yoon was preparing to start his day at a site near the accessory store. While heading down to the basement level of the construction site to gather his tools, he saw something in the corner but wasn't there a day earlier. Under a bag of cement, he found the body of a high school girl who was still wearing her uniform. It was Chong Soo Yoon, who was reported missing the day before. With the exception of a deep imprint on her neck, there were no signs of rape or a struggle, with no external injuries as well as no signs of a mugging as all the cash she had on her was left untouched. But a closer look at the body revealed something very disturbing. Both of Soo Yoon's hands were cut off. Police spoke with locals and witnesses and suspected that Soyun went missing and was killed during a 15-minute window between 8.20 and 8.35 p.m. Now let's take a look at the accessory store where she worked for a minute. Its shutters weren't closed. The lights were still on, but the store's door was locked. That showed Soyun left the store for a short time and was planning to return before getting off at 9.00. Investigators could not figure out whether she had stepped out to meet someone or to use the bathroom. They also had a hard time determining whether she was killed at the construction site where she was found, or elsewhere, and later dumped at the site. After the discovery of an apparently blood-stained pickaxe at the scene, police came to the initial conclusion that the killer strangled the victim and cut off her hands with the axe. It was later determined that the pickaxe was used often at the construction site. But the mystery remained. Why were her hands cut off? On March 9, a day after the victim's body was found, what were believed to be her severed hands were spotted in the water under a stream bridge around 200 meters from the site. The palms were faced up, as if someone had intentionally placed them that way. The nails on the hands were also excessively short, unlike the long nails the victim preferred, showing the possibility the killer tried to destroy evidence. But no clues about the perpetrator, such as DNA, were detected on the hands. 
A detailed analysis led to the belief that the hands were discarded in the water three hours before they were found, rather than right after Soyun's murder. The question arose of why the killer went through the trouble of ditching the hands in the stream, where it could have been found easily. The stream was also nearly completely frozen, making it difficult to conclude the hands floated downstream. That means the severed hands were intentionally placed in the stream under the bridge. Experts said this was careless rather than discreet, and they assumed the hands were discarded in the stream after the killer debated what to do with them. There was something else that could be assumed about the perpetrator. The fact that there were almost no traces of blood in the vicinity of the construction site where the hands were believed to have been cut off was also strange. If the hands were severed while the victim was still alive, there would have been a considerable amount of blood at the site. But only a few drops were discovered, meaning the killer most likely cut the hands after she was dead. Again, investigators couldn't wrap their heads around why the girl's hands were removed. Police did notice, however, that the victim's hands were very cleanly cut off helping them to realize whoever was behind the crime was probably very skilled with a pickaxe. And that is why they focused on construction workers at the start of their probe. But later, after some time went by, fractures were found on the wrists, meaning several attempts were made to cut off the hands. And this showed the killer wasn't necessarily skilled at using a pickaxe after all. Despite dead ends in the investigation, there were various other pieces of evidence. Remember the bag of cement the victim was found under? A ballpoint pen with a car brand name on it was discovered on top of the bag. It was a promotional pen handed out by a local salesman. Yun, the construction worker who first found the girl, had the same pen, and he became a person of interest. Police asked him if he had the pen on him, but he couldn't give a straight answer. It was also odd when it was revealed that Yoon didn't report the body he found right away, but rather went to the restaurant his wife owned nearby and asked her to do it instead. When he was asked why he did that, he gave various reasons, one of them being he was afraid because he had a criminal record, including for assault. After a few lies were detected in a police polygraph, he became the prime suspect. The imprint found on the victim's neck was very similar to the one of the soles of Yun's shoes. There were even fingernail scratches on the back of his hands. Everything seemed to fall into place. But the footprint wasn't an outline, but rather part of a wave pattern from the sole of a shoe making it difficult to definitely conclude that it was Yoon's shoe. Even the cuts on the back of his hands were not enough to establish that he had anything to do with the murder, that there was a struggle with the victim as they were discovered a week after the incident. In an interview with a local broadcaster in 2014, Yoon said he was falsely accused and that police forced his confession at the time. There was indeed a reason that police focused on construction workers as their main suspects. It was difficult for the general public to enter the basement level of the construction site, especially dark and isolated parts. The person that dumped the body at the site must have been also very familiar with their surroundings. In addition, there was a high fence set up around the site at the time, and the two entrances towards the road were locked. This means the killer could have only used a back door that only they likely knew about. But let's take a look at this case from a different perspective and other possible scenarios. We could also suspect the perpetrator was an acquaintance or friend of the victim. This possibility resurfaced in 2014, 13 years after the murder. A local broadcaster covered the case and looked into the store's phone records. And here comes another possible suspect, a boy sir named Huang, a friend of Soyun's. He had sent her as many as 29 messages confessing his love for her. 
and on the day of the incident, Huang called Soyun at the store around 7:30 p.m. and they talked for about three minutes. Around an hour later, at 8:27 p.m., Huang phoned her again at the store, but that conversation lasted only around 19 seconds. No one will ever know what they talked about. The production crew finally got a hold of Huang, but he made excuses, saying he doesn't remember sending Soyun any messages or even calling her. And then he was later unreachable. Huang wasn't the only suspicious character. Soyun's other friend, a boy surnamed Park, was absent from school for two days after her severed hands were found. Also, the detective in charge at the time sent a text message to all of Soyun's friends, asking them why they think the killer cut off her hands. And there was only one friend who sent a reply anonymously. It was Park. He had also consistently mentioned Soyun's murder case online. He was asked by the production crew at the time why he left such messages, and he answered in a very unpleasant manner, saying he was emotional. There were scores of suspicious characters, but not too much information about the victim's friends existed at the early stages of the investigation. It's probably because most of the efforts and resources at the time were poured into looking into the construction workers. But then, after some more time passed in 2018, the police received another tip-off from a woman who was 10 years old at the time of the murder in 2001. It was a stunner of a new story. She said she remembered meeting a man near the construction site. Adding, he was lightly dressed with a windbreaker and a backpack. She said he asked her where the bathroom was, but in a very luring way, which made her run towards her mom's car. She clearly remembers it was around 7:10 in the evening. That wasn't all. She said that while she was waiting for her mom in the car, she saw the man again, but this time. He was taking a girl somewhere, and even heard her scream. She wrapped up her account by saying that the man reappeared with a mysteriously looking plastic bag. Her testimony was used to name a new suspect, a carpenter surnamed Kim, whose alibi wasn't confirmed properly. Then, on the day of the incident, Kim told his fellow workers that he was traveling to his hometown of Busan because he hurt his eye. This eliminated him from the investigation because he had left the Yangdong region. But a TV program covering the case re-examined it and requested an interview with him, which he willingly agreed to. He said he was lightly dressed on that day, wearing hiking clothes and a backpack. He also said it doesn't make sense that he would commit such an act if he was going to rape someone. He was the one who said the word "rape" first. Profilers and the production crew had no choice but to be very suspicious of the man. Could he be the killer? After an investigation, he was reportedly ruled out as a suspect. And the cold case investigation unit at the Chungbuk Provincial Police Agency is continuing its pursuit of the killer. All we can do now. Is hope and wait until someone reveals new information about what actually happened on that cold early spring night, over 21 years ago, to finally give Soyun's family closure. Megan's case files will continue next episode. Thanks for watching.